The Roman Empire has the rare distinction of being both one of the largest and longest lasting empires in human history. During the first century AD, the Imperial Roman Legionary played a central role in the rapid expansion and consolidation of the empire. These professional soldiers, numbering over 150,000, were among the most successful in history, which brought the Roman state to the height of its power. Their accomplishments were achieved through rigorous training, discipline, as well as having the latest and greatest infantry equipment of the era. The ancient Imperial Roman legionary wore a simple tunic, which was often dyed red, as well as being associated with Mars, the Roman god of war, who mythologically sired Rome's founders Romulus and Remus. Red dye was cheap and readily available in most areas of the empire. Typically, madder root was used for red dye production, which could also easily be dried and exported. Most legionary tunics were either made of wool or linen, which was thinner and lighter, which made it the favored material for hotter climates and summer months. Because it did not retain most dyes available to the Romans very well, linen was usually bleached white or left in a natural off-white state. Other cheaper colors, such as green, obtained through a variety of plant-based dyes, brown and black were also used to a lesser extent. It has also been hypothesized that Roman legionaries assigned for naval duty as marines wore blue. Associated with Neptune, god of the sea, blue dye was also relatively inexpensive, although not as cheap as red. A Roman legionary recruit was required to be able to march 22 miles in less than 6 hours, wearing armor and carrying a full pack, weighing at least 45 pounds. Roman legions frequently marched 20 to 30 miles in a day before seizing strategic locations, a battlefield of their choosing, or making camp. It has often been noted, the Roman army defeated their enemies on many occasions simply by outmarching them. To accomplish this, the legionary needed some formidable footwear. The caliga was a heavy-duty sandal boot that had hobnails hammered into the thick sole, enabling it to grip the ground better, in the same way as a modern sports cleat. The hobnail pattern on the bottom of the boot also had a similar function to that of a modern sports shoe, with ball, arch, and heel support. The ancient Roman author Juvenal cautioned civilians against antagonizing a legionary, who in retaliation might kick their shins, leaving a nasty wound. In the hot Mediterranean climate, the open lattice-like design of the upper portion of the boot allowed for efficient ventilation, which reduced sweaty feet and blisters. This design also allowed the boot to drain and dry quickly after crossing rivers and streams. In winter months and cooler climates, a legionary would opt for the socks and sandals look. In northern regions, trousers and a variety of enclosed boot designs were commonly worn for much of the year. The Emperor Gaius Julius Caesar, who was named after his more famous relative of the same name, is more commonly known by his infamous nickname, Caligula. Caligula means little boots. The soldiers his father commanded gave him the endearing nickname, as he wore a miniature uniform and miniature caligae, while accompanying his father on campaign as a child. Along with the caligae, the military belt was another item closely tied to the legionary's identity. Josephus writes how the sounds of jingling belts and the crunch of iron hobnails on their shoes announced the presence of a soldier. The sound of many thousands of legionaries marching in step was intended to inspire awe or fear. The soldier's belt was a great source of pride for the legionary. Often, additional details and embellishments were added to personalize the belt. The leather straps with metal studs and ornaments hanging from the belt provided a degree of groin protection, which is important, but it was primarily aesthetic, and was shortened and went out of style in the 2nd century AD. Wearing the belt tightly also helped to distribute some of the weight of the armor from the shoulders to the hips. Often beneath the military belt, a cloth waistband was worn, which protected the stomach and back from chafing caused by the belt and armor. The waistband was also folded in such a manner so that it served as a pocket to store money or whatever small items the legionary wished to carry on his person. In the early 1st century, along with the introduction of segmented plate armor, a scarf became standard issue to prevent scarring and chafing around the tight-fitting neck plates. Soldiers wearing older scale and male armor adopted its use shortly afterwards. The fashionable scarves were also worn off-duty and identified a man as a soldier. 
It has been hypothesized that the color of the legionary scarf signified what unit he belonged to. This is reasonable to assume, as it would have been cheaper and easier to supply than maintaining uniform tunic color. Tunics wore out quickly due to heavy use and were replaced often using whatever color fabric was available. The legionary is primarily thought of as a swordsman, charging forward into the enemy and using his sword to thrust, rather than slash. The legionary's gladius was a short thrusting and chopping sword designed for use within a densely packed and ordered formation of men. The sword of the first century evolved from Spanish swords of the late third century BC that the Romans had encountered during the Punic Wars against Carthage. The sword was carried in a sheath and baldric, the feared weapon was designed to cause massive damage. The gladius was two-edged, suited for cutting and chopping. Its wide blade had a tapered point, which was ideal for the legionary's primary attack, which was a thrust to the belly. The large wound created by this was almost certainly deadly. The ridged handle, shaped to receive the user's four fingers, provided a secure ergonomic hand grip. The cross guard and scabbard were often personalized to suit the owner's taste. The Imperial Legionary's helmet was the amalgamation of the best features of earlier Italian and Gallic helmets. A substantial neck guard, ear cutouts, visor, and eyebrow ridges were a few of its most prominent features. The hinged cheek pieces allowed for the helmet to be spread over the chest while marching. It is important to note that expensive equipment such as helmets were rarely discarded as new revisions were introduced into the ranks. Consequently, during the 1st century AD, older Coolis pattern helmets would have been used alongside Imperial Gallic helmets, as they were slowly phased out of service. The Lorica Segmentata, segmented plate armor, came into use during the reign of Augustus. Although it appears to be the most popularly used armor during the 1st century AD, older chainmail and scale mail did not completely disappear from use. Each class of armor had its own virtues and drawbacks. Originating in the Near East, scale mail had been used for more than a thousand years by the time of the first Emperor Augustus. The thin overlapping scale version the Romans produced provided the least effective protection of their major armor types. But on the plus side, it was the cheapest and easiest to produce, as well as repair. Lorica squamata was most commonly used by provincial auxiliary troops, but would have been sporadically present in the legions as well. The Romans adopted chainmail from the Celts and modified it to contain riveted rings which increased its strength. Lorica Hamada allowed the greatest flexibility of movement, but was the heaviest of the three, and extremely labor-intensive to create. Segmented armor was quicker to manufacture, provided the greatest level of protection, and was significantly lighter than mail. On the downside, it was much more costly and time-consuming to maintain and repair when put to heavy use. The Pugio was a small, wide dagger resembling a diminutive gladius, which was attached to the left side of the belt. Like the gladius used in the imperial era, the Pugio was also descended from a Spanish blade encountered during the Punic Wars, and altered over time. It was widely believed that this dagger was not always standard issue, but because it was found to be extremely effective in close-quarter combat such as sieges, many legionaries purchased them on their own. The pilum was a very specialized type of heavy javelin, designed for use at close range immediately before the charge. The base of the pilum's shaft was constructed of a softer iron so that it would bend after significant impact. This was done to prevent the enemy picking up the javelin and throwing it back at the Romans. Also, to accomplish this same goal, the iron pins which held both halves of the pilum together were sometimes switched out for wooden pegs, which easily popped out after impact. The legionary carried a large rectangular curved shield called a scutum. It was made of three alternating layers of laminated wood strips covered in felt and calf skin with a large iron boss at the center and a metal rim. This heavy shield was an offensive weapon as well as a defensive one. During the charge and when engaged with the enemy, the legionary could use the prominent iron boss to punch the enemy, potentially unbalancing and toppling them. Its design is believed to be initially based on Celtic shields of the 6th century BC, and evolved its iconic features over time. There is much conjecture surrounding the details of Roman shield painting, 
But generally speaking, throughout Republican Roman times, the patterns painted on shields varied widely and were slowly standardized over the centuries. During the reign of Augustus, wings and thunderbolt patterns became widespread, and by the later first century, most legionaries would have carried some variation of the motif on their shield. While marching on campaign, the legionary carried the scutum in a leather case slung over his back. Originally a piece of gladiator equipment, the Manica Arm Guard's use was adopted by both legionaries and provincial auxiliary troops beginning in the first century AD. Based on artistic depictions of the time, during the Emperor Trajan's Dacian campaign, its use increased to counter Dacian warriors armed with large two-handed curved swords capable of severing a Roman's unarmed arm with a single swing. The increased protection these internally padded metal plates would have provided restricted the legionaries' flexibility to some extent. Consequently, the decision to purchase and wear one must have been a tough decision, and it is likely the Manica was never standard issue. This has been Epimetheus, and I hope you have enjoyed this video and the drawings I made. A huge thanks to my supporters over on Patreon. There you can help me out with the cost of making more videos like this. Also be sure to let me know in the comments of what you think of this type of video, and like, subscribe, and all that other good stuff.